This is Jamila Rose, candidate for 45th City Council District. And uh, you're meeting with the Tilder Block Association, which is the 32nd Street Block Association and the 31st Street Block Association. And we're really grateful for you taking the time to meet with us. We know how hard it is to be a candidate and everything that you've done to put yourself out there and show leadership for the district. And so we, we're really grateful for everything that you're doing and for meeting with us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So the first thing we want is just to spend about three minutes and we'd like to hear about your background and then your vision for the district and how you plan to um, work with us and understand our priorities for the district. Sure, so um, I'm Jamela Rose, pronounced Jamela, and I grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, I've been a resident of East Flatbush for most of my life. Uh, my parents are both entrepreneurs and so I grew up in an entrepreneurial home where I learned to work in both my father's construction company and my mother's healthcare services agency, where we had a daycare as well as a company that provided services for children with special needs. And um, I worked with both agencies until I was about 25 years old. And when I was 25, my brother was murdered. Um, when that happened, it really changed my life and my life took, began to take a different course and I became a community activist. And um, we started a nonprofit organization which is called the Christopher Rose Community Empowerment Campaign. It's an organization that I still partner with. I sit on the board as a trustee and as the managing director of policy and advocacy. And through that time that I was advocating for my community, working on anti-violence initiatives, creating programming for young people, ensuring that my community could be a safer place than it was before, um, that's when an opportunity came about and the current, bar the previous borough president asked me to sit on staff and design and implement youth programming throughout the borough of Brooklyn. And that's pretty much how I got my start in government. Um, I was able to work with the Department of Health to look at models for violence prevention. There was a model called ceasefire that was used in other states where you would provide violence interrupters. They would be individuals from the community. They would be um, pretty much known or sometimes they could be formally incarcerated and they would then work with young people and become mentors to these young people. And that program did not exist in East Flatbush. It did exist outside in other parts of the city and I advocated to bring it to my community because I thought it would make a, um, a big difference. And when our now council member um, came in, he was able to expand that program across the city, not just for East Flatbush, but throughout all the black and brown communities. So that was a large portion of my work, um, including working with juvenile justice reform. One of the things that I also experienced was my brother's murderer was 16 years old. And because at that time, young people, and because of the nature of the crime, he was charged as an adult and spent time in an adult prison. And within a few months of being incarcerated, he attempted to commit suicide multiple times. And so I began working on juvenile justice issues because his mom and my mom and our families actually bonded over the murder because we saw it as two lost children. He, he was doing 22 to life and my brother was gone. Um, and most of the rest of my work in government involved revolved around constituent services, small business services, and also public health. So I can get into that a little later. Um, but I do believe that my, my vision for this district is a district where de overdevelopment is not happening, a district where young people are thriving and schools are provided with adequate resources to support our young people through college, and also where families are not having to pick and choose between do I send my kids to a private school or do I pay my mortgage? You know, that's something that some parents are facing on an everyday um, basis or do I pay my rent? You know, and um, I would like to make sure that the next person who's in office is taking a micro-focused um, approach to dealing with the inequities in our school system as well as some basic public health issues including women's health. I'm going to move that mic just a little bit yeah. for you. I think it's just a little bit hot. It's going to serve you better. So um, you seem like a person who keeps metrics, is my guess. <laughs> uh, so that program that you brought here uh, to uh, stop juvenile violence, do you have metrics of how many um, acts of violence you actually intercepted or prevented? Do you have any idea how effective it was? So there's two separate things. Um, the program that I'm speaking of is called Cease Fire, and it's a model. I have not implemented that model myself. Community-based organizations have been selected to implement that model in the community. Um, and we do know that it is effective and violence does go down. There's an organization at Crown Heights that was doing it many years ago, and now in East Flatbush we have um, GMAC, which is Gangsters Making Astronomical Changes, Astronomical Community Changes. So I don't have those metrics offhand because I don't over provide oversight for that. 
Um, but for the organization, for the programs that we have run through our nonprofit, we've provided oh. mental, not mental health, we've provided um, tutoring for children who are doing math and who are not doing that well in their courses. And we've noticed that after a couple of months, usually within three months of providing these services, the children are able to do better in school. Um, they're able to focus. We've expanded some of that programming in, into East New York. Um, also, we work with mothers who are pregnant and who have children um, under the age of five. And pretty much we serve about 200 families a year in a nonprofit organization, and we're able to see the rates of infant mortality go down. Um, we're also able to see that women can you are. So, by how much? I'm, and I'm going to move that mic back towards you a little bit now. I don't know if we can just sort of <laughs> split the difference. It's a little hot before. Mm -hmm. Hi, do you want to say your name again? Sure. Jamila Rose. How is that? Mm -hmm. Is it. Can you put it, get it closer? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm an audio technician, so I just like it when it sounds there you good. Go. <laughs> okay. So, what, what we do know is like in some parts of the borough, um, especially in East Lapwish and Brownsville, infant mortality were at rates as high as 12 percent um, when we're talking about these communities of color. And in, I believe in East Flatbush, it might have been somewhere between 9 and maybe 10, 10 percent, um, which is fairly high, which means these are young people, children or infants who are dying at an early age, um, not necessarily in birth. And so what we look at when we track metrics through our nonprofit organization, because we're looking at dealing with the same population, people of color, women of a certain age, who are pregnant or parenting. And what we see is that of the people who we provide case management services for, the rates of infant mortality or the rates of maternal morbidity are below the threshold or, or what was what's known as the, the rate in the city of New York. And so, so you're seeing the rates go down. We're seeing but I'm asking you, it sounds like you've managed quite a few programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to get a sense of not only your um, efficacy, but also uh, if you measure, if you're the type of person who measures your efficacy, so of any of those programs, could you give us some metrics of what the success rate was for the program? You know, the resources you invested, mm -hmm. and then what the success rate was. Specifically, in numbers, I don't have it off the top of my head. Or just generally, like we, you know, we we know that we made an impact on this. It sounds like you felt that you made an impact on infant mortality. Do you have a sense of how many families you helped in what period of time? We serve about 200 families a year. And so we've been doing infant mortality work um, maybe for about five to six years now through our nonprofit organization. And what was the other question? Like, I'm just trying to get a sense of how you're gauging your success. You're working with 200 families. How are you gauging whether or not your work is successful there? Well, we submit reports to Department of Health. So the city has what was, it was previously called the Infant Mortality Reduction Initiative, IMRI, and pretty much they go out, they do research, they gather data, and they're the ones who are able to say, based on information coming from the local hospitals, that X amount of women are having children and they're experiencing incidences of maternal morbidity, or X amount of babies are being born and we're noticing that parents are not breastfeeding, or X, you know, like, Right, That's they're providing data, data back. Data. Did their data confirm that your work was impactful? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And how impactful? How impactful? Like, we think that we, I don't know. Uh, we'll just move on. I'm just trying to get us. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what else you want me to say other than like literally getting on my phone, Googling the health right. stats, and then reading them back to you. All right. I don't have that in front of me. It's like, it's really technical data, uh -huh. and I don't have it. Like readily off the top of my head. You felt that you were helping the families and you had some uh, confidence that the data was coming back to confirm that. No, we were. It's not a feeling. We are helping families. We're monitored by Department of Health and this is data that's public knowledge that comes out every year in the um, in like the, the health the health grades. It's public knowledge. And we're part of a coalition of nonprofits that are funded to support women, people of color, in specific zip codes to provide these services. And our work has been um, recognized on a citywide level and also on a national level. Um, the, the, the nonprofit that administers most of the grants is called the Brooklyn Perinatal Network. Um, I also sit on their board. I'm a board member and trustee. And there's also Korean Women's Health Association. There's our organization. There's a diaspora. Um, they used to be called, um, I forgot the name of it. But they provide maternal infant health services throughout the Haitian community. And all of us together, we take on different portions of maternal health and work with the same population. And together, our data comes in. 
and we're able to see the differences in the community that's made based on all of our data coming into the Department of Health. So it's not a feeling, it's, it's, it's statistics. That's what I was trying to get at. I was trying to get some specifics, like to hear you say, we did this and this. And I mean, one of the things a city council person has to do is to be effective in terms of um, presenting themselves and their achievements. So, you know, uh, I was just sort of getting a sense of you and how you present yourself. Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of y your specific priorities for the for the district, can you just give us really short and tight your three top priorities for the district? Sure, so one of the top priorities is housing, of course, um, and land use. Right now we are in both crises in our community. The land use issue is that there's a lot of overdevelopment. Um, even though it's as of right, because the developers are purchasing land and building on it, um, what's happening is it's out of character for that specific community. So you would have a block of row houses, and maybe three people or four people will live in them. They've owned their homes for 30 years, 40 years, or maybe they could have just purchased into the community two years ago. And a developer will buy the house next door. It's a one-family house, and then they will build up multiple stories, um, and then 40 people move next door. And that's something that many residents and neighbors are just, they're not comfortable with. They don't believe that that's how their neighborhood should continue to be developed. They don't believe that that's what they purchased when they bought their homes for $600,000 or seven hundred dollars or whenever they bought it. They bought the community, you know, and that is what they wanted. And they also, there's a, there's, um, there's a basic need within the community to kind of not a need, um, it's a want in the community for things to kind of remain similar to how we purchased it many years ago. And what would you specifically do to prevent that overdevelopment from happening? So what needs to be done, um, the community has to provide their feedback, it's their voices. The people who own the land are the ones who make these decisions. And right now our community board, which is Community Board 17, they have a land use committee and they're working to create a proposal with um, architects and engineers and, 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 and other people, experts in that field, to decide how the community should be developed moving forward. So there's no plan for the district. Right now, things are just happening because they're happening, but we want things to happen according to a plan. So if we say Rogers Avenue will be upzoned and then we're going to build large developments there, that has to come from the community. That's not for a council member to decide. The community members have to speak up and provide that feedback and determine for themselves how they would like to see themselves affected. Because at the end of the day, it affects your property taxes and everything else, your school. So one of the things that we found in our community is very hard to get people excited and involved with zoning. It's a complicated issue. It feels overwhelming. We don't necessarily understand it. We've had somebody who's very informed about zoning in our community and architect try to hold forums on it and get people involved. It's very hard to get people out. What would you, as our council representative and our community leader, do to inform people, motivate people, and get people at the table? So I think one of the places where borough presidents and council members have a role in that is your community board membership in the first place. So if land use is an issue for our district or um, housing, then we should make sure that we're appointing people to the board that can handle some of these issues. At the end of the day, the board members are the ones who are having the committee meetings. They're bringing people to the table, so we need to make sure we have representation from people in our community who can understand those issues and who have capacity to understand it. Experts. I'm sure among us, we have architects, we have engineers, we have, um, you know, whatever else is required to make some of these critical decisions. And then, of course, we need to make sure that data is accessible. Um, we need to have more forums, break down these policy initiatives into layman's terms, where people can just voice their opinions and have a say. And you would consider this part of your job description to help our community with this issue? That is the role of a council member, yeah. Great, okay, super. And uh, just moving on to another issue, uh, the greening of the neighborhood is really important to us. We have a block association that's planted trees and flowers um, all up and down our neighborhood. What would you do to help us continue to green the entire district? You know, as I've been speaking to residents in Flatbush, they've been talking about a lack of green space altogether um, and how we could even 
we, and then I'm gonna answer your question, and even how we can use like different playgrounds and schoolyards and other places to create more green space. So I really wanna look into that and figure out how, how can we create more green spaces that are accessible, not just to people who may attend a certain school, but that are accessible to the public. And then in addition to that, um, gardening programs, I feel we can get our young people interested in gardening, um, working with some of the community spaces, creating com more community gardens. Um, and then I know that there's also like private sector small grants, micro grants that block associations can apply for. But um, the, council's, the council member's office should also be able to provide some discretionary funds to support block associations. When I was with the borough president's office, they would give a small $200 stipend for to have block parties. But I think you can probably do more to support um, groups who want to do green, green work. Nice. Love that. And then we really feel that the litter is one of the main problems in the neighborhood. And we've had a really difficult time getting ma the maintenance department to come through with more garbage cans for our corners. We're having trouble getting the businesses to cooperate and even getting the city to fine the businesses the full amount. We see the businesses are just getting their tickets um, written off in bulk at low rates. What would you do to help us get the litter off the streets? Sure. So my previous experience as um, the liaison for a bid that was in bed -Stuy is that they were having issues with garbage and litter. Most of the businesses have to use a private company to pick up their trash. Um, and I believe that bid at that time, they had to get Department of Sanitation involved and they had to um, kind of tighten the regulations and to make sure that the trash was getting picked up. But then they also had to create an initiative to create more trash cans on the avenue. Um, part of the litter is if people have no place to throw it, yeah. it's gonna end up on the floor. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's how it is. Like even on Flatbush, this, I know this is not Flatbush Avenue, but even on Flatbush, sometimes you just see a lot of things, a lot of litter, and um, we need more garbage cans. Those things can be sponsored by your business improvement district, and the council person can also partner with the business improvement districts and other and provide other resources to get some of those things done. So we, and that would be a priority for you because we're having a hard time getting the businesses involved. We've gone door to door with businesses sometimes. We've written letters. We've asked them to participate. It's like pulling teeth. It's hard. So there's we would want to know that there's, I'm sorry. Is there a bid? A business improvement district? Not immediately. No. You don't Avenue, have one. Church Avenue used to have one, but not in this area. So then you probably need to create a merchant association or a business improvement district. And that's something that you would help us with. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> Super, okay. Um, I, I work uh, as an election security journalist, mm -hmm. and one of my main concerns is that the Board of Elections is corrupt and incompetent. We've seen investigations showing that the executive director has been flown all over the country by the voting machine vendor, and the um, Board of Elections is also in the par uh, process of uh, possibly procuring voting equipment that is extremely risky and, uh, open and uh, that security experts have said could be hacked. Uh, in a very bad way. Um, we want to know what you would do to make the Board of Elections more competent, more transparent, and more secure. <sighs> board of Elections. So, I, I don't even know if I have an answer for that right off the top of my head. Um, you know, I think part of the issue with the Board of Elections, one is training, like on election day, like just making sure that the people who are working the polls are trained and know what they're doing. I know we had a huge issue last year. It was raining and they said all the machines jammed because of the rain and, and whatever. I don't really know what that was about, but even my nephew, he was a poll worker and um, he mentioned that <laughs> they put him through a class and the class was very short and then after that they asked you a whole bunch of questions and he didn't even understand the questions. Um, and I think you got trained in, right? And, and you were able to do whatever you had to do, but I feel like the training needs to be better. Um, for election day workers. And then also in terms of the equipment, I had an opportunity to look at some of this equipment when I went to Albany in, um, I think it was March. I went to Albany in March and they were displaying the equipment for people to see. And anytime we roll out new technology, there has to be a way that we can ensure that it, it's secure. Um, whether it's our Department of um, Do It, I remember what it stands for, but that's the acronym. But somehow we have to ensure that it's safe and that um, there's firewalls and that people cannot hack into it. And if there's any doubt that it's safe, then that's not something that we can spend millions and millions of dollars on. I know that the city or the state is about to move forward and purchase very expensive equipment and we need to ensure that it cannot be hacked if that's the case. And whether it's 
I, I'm not sure what the council can do because I believe it's a state issue. Um, there is a city council uh, department. I was actually at the committee mm -hmm. meeting of, uh, it's like the government, um, I think it's government affairs, government equipment. Uh, Fernando Cabrera is okay. the head of that uh, committee and he was holding uh, hearings and trying to gain more information from security experts mm -hmm. about that equipment. Um, but I think there's a general accountability issue. The Board of Elections, it, um, meets in private for um, a lot of their decisions. They uh, they do have a public meeting every week, but they make a lot of their decisions behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And those uh, board of directors, those board of election commissioners, are appointed by the political parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, there really is not much oversight happening right now, although there has been attempts. I know our previous council person, Jumani Williams, had actually called for uh, the executive director, Michael Ryan, to be fired, as did the head of Common Cause, Susan Lerner, because of his conflicts of interest. But um, I think we would just want to know, would you be a partner with us in trying to get in there and see if we could get more accountability and more competence? You're talking about positions that really require competence that are political appointments right now. And it's a problem. Do you understand, you understand what Can I'm I saying? I understand what you're yeah. saying. And there needs to be more accountability in the Board of Elections. Um, and it needs to just be more effective altogether. I, I had shared yesterday even just something as simple as being able to get um, language access, you know, and getting forms in the language that the city says it provides the forms in was difficult for me. The, the links online didn't work. I called the offices using the number that was listed and they didn't know what I was talking about. And I was like, how am I supposed to get these language? Um, these forms in this other language if you're not providing it. Like, there, there's no place else to get it from. And then they mentioned I had to come pick it up, whatever. Anyway, my point is, it, it wasn't even provided in New York's, in, um, what do you call it, in the Brooklyn Board of Elections. I had to go elsewhere to get it. So those are some of just the, in, the inefficiencies of Board of Elections altogether. And I think, like you're saying, providing that transparency, providing that accountability, making sure that people are not elected from party bosses or having to go through that process will just make it easier. People, it will be more effective. Right, we need appointments based on competence mm -hmm. and skills, yes. absolutely. It's glad to hear you say that. Um, okay, so I just wanna ask you, let's see, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the governor of New York has, you know, signed his law with the early eviction early election process in New York. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Do you think that's perfect? I mean, it's very... With early voting? A question about early voting and whether or not she supports it. Sure, I do support early early voting. Um, I know it's done in other states. Um, and it's exciting because sometimes people would prefer to just vote in person rather than filling out an absentee ballot. Um, the only thing about early voting that I have reservations about. I mean, it's not like reservations where I think we shouldn't do it. It's just, do we have enough sites for early voting? Um, and is that a step in the right direction or do we need to do an overhaul on the way we vote, period? So I was thinking about access. When I think about voting and I think about access and the fact that our turnout is so low and like less than 30% of the people in New York City who are registered voters actually vote, early voting is important, yes, but I also think um, we need to move forward in our technology to a place where you can vote anywhere in the borough that you live or maybe anywhere in the city that you live. So if you want to vote near your job during lunch or if you want to vote when, before you go to work at home or if you want to vote when you pick up your kids from daycare, you should be able to do that. So I'm not saying that early voting is not something that's good. It's a great thing. It's a step forward. But I really feel like instead of just trying to like make small tweaks to the system, that we should just go for it and really move forward with some really um, sweeping changes to the way we vote. I think that actually is the intention of the early voting. The early voting centers, and you're gonna be able to vote at any of the early voting centers. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have, uh, that's why we're moving to electronic poll books, because mm -hmm. then you will be able to, Correct. you'll be, yeah, you'll be mm -hmm. listed there in the electronic poll book anywhere, mm -hmm. and they're gonna probably go with ballot on demand machines, so yeah. that it'll uh, print out. So I think we are moving in that direction. But it should be like that, period. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how I feel, like, you know, just period. I feel like that would deal with the issue of, I need to vote early. You know, because it's just more accessible. And then we can just have one voting day and you can vote wherever you want. 
right? but and just because I'm an election security specialist, it does open us up for more risk uh, because those machines are out in the public for long periods of time, uh, probably about 11 days total. Uh, so there's other safeguards that we do need to put in place. Uh, mm -hmm. But it sounds like for the machines, for the equipment, we also need to start doing better audits so that we're actually, because the machines are going to be exposed to more risk, we need to be checking the totals, the actual election results by hand in larger numbers to make sure that those machines have not been manipulated or massaged in some way. So you're saying because of the early voting, it's allowing for more vulnerability. It absolutely is allowing for more so. vulnerability. I agree. I agree. Okay, I'm going to ask one more quick question for you because uh, I was very impressed at the forum last night. You said that you had worked with an organization that got a $20 million grant. And did I hear you say that correctly? There's, there's some truth in that. Okay. <laughs> I <laughs> well, it was interesting to me because I felt I heard you downplay it so much. You said we asked for 40 million and we only got 20 million. Mm -hmm. And I never heard somebody just say shyly, "We only got 20 million," because I was very impressed that you got 20 million. So I just wanted to hear you brag about that a little bit and tell us, you know, how you did that and what you did with it. Sure. So when we were talking about the money and lobbying the state legislator, I was speaking about the census and the fact that um, there is an organization called New York Counts, and I was the former chair of outreach and organizing, but the former acting co-chair of outreach and organizing for a few months. And one of the things that was part of our policy agenda was to have the state legislature provide $40 million to community-based organizations to do census outreach and education in their own spaces. That way we can begin to prepare the general public for the US Census, which will happen on April 1st, 2020. The reason we have to do all of this work is because in 2010, when the census was given, we had a severe undercount in Brooklyn, which ended up being an undercount in New York State. Therefore, we lost two seats in Congress and representation, one seat in, um, I think, upstate and one seat in Queens. Um, with this new administration that's in office, they've added a citizenship question to the census, which is more about scaring um, people into not completing the census, um, and which would lead to an undercount in communities that require that federal, those federal resources to come in the most. And that would cover our education systems, our hospitals, our infrastructure, um, even workforce development programs, Title I, um, SNAP, anything you can think of that we use on a daily basis is funded through the census. So if you wanted to defund sanctuary cities, you know, sanctuary cities, um, the only way you can do it really is through an undercount in the census. Therefore, there aren't really people in those cities because you're going to undercount immigrants and people of color. And so those cities just don't get resources. So um, that's why we need to be edu educating the public. And that's why $40 million is needed. The algorithm, not the algorithm, the formula that they used to determine how much money was by looking at the number of people in New York State and deciding that we needed at least $2 per person. Um, we lobbied. We, meaning the um, New York Counts 2020, which is a, a coalition, a statewide coalition of about 150 organizations. My organization is representing like East Flatbush and um, other other parts and other populations, the Caribbean population, because that's predominantly who we serve. Um, and we lobbied the state legislature on March 4th, Assembly and Senate, asking them for the 40 million, and they recently approved on both the assembly level and the Senate level $20 million for community-based organizations. So that was a win. Congratulations. It was a huge win. And I mean, you know, it was like a bittersweet because we have $20 million, but we need 40. You know? <laughs> and when you think about it, because 40 sounds big, but we're not talking about New York City. We're talking about New York State. We know that most of the need will be for downstate, but at the same time, we have to remember that there are populations upstate New York that need resources as well. Maybe not because it's an immigrant population, but because maybe it's more rural and you need to get the word out and get people engaged. So um, we're really hoping that the city is going to supplement um, some of those resources and kind of fill in the gaps where the state fell short. Um, but we are grateful for the 20 million. Super. Well, we're grateful for you coming and spending time with us today, you sharing your vision with us and for all the work that you're doing. Shamela Rose, thank you so much. Thank you.